When we talk about excellence and game plan for life, for those of you who don't know, the birth of game plan for life came from this. How many of you remember the Duke lacrosse quote unquote scandal that turned out to be a district attorney scandal? <laughs> But I was in the Dallas airport flying home, grabbed the USA Today that was outside my Hilton hotel room as I tripped over it, sprinting to the airport at about 5 a.m. And not even in the sports section, but in the second section, section B, there was a full page ad taken out by a group of people after the news came out. The DA was corrupt. It was literally a stance. He tried to railroad the kids, so forth. But I was asking that ad, how about a standing ovation for a group of young men? And our culture gave them one. Because they were innocent of gang rape that was fictional and made up. But I had a hard time standing up for the keg party and the debauchery that they did on a regular basis that came out in public and was all okay all of a sudden. Well, at least you didn't kill anybody. Well, you didn't do this. And all of a sudden, I woke up as the parent of two ki young kids at the time my culture wants my kids to applaud that. I'm glad they were innocent. I'm glad they didn't get railroaded. It was awful what happened, and I, I, I believe that. But it hit me hard on that flight home that that's the culture my kids will grow up in. Out of that came, what can we offer them that's different? And I was tired of the Optimist Club, JC, Civitans, all the behavioral moral code character plans that seemed to exist. And I had a question of myself, what are the godly traits I'd want my children to have? Fast forward, love, 1 Corinthians 13, and in my opinion, Exodus 21, yep, the Ten Commandments, because before we ever get the Ten Commandments, what, what's the first words in, in Exodus 20? I am the Lord your God. Before he ever gives me any rules, he established that I have a relationship with him. I don't even have to say I do. I don't have to accept it. I have a relationship. That's a lovely thing for me to know before I start misbehaving against the ten things or honoring the ten things. Integrity. Job 27.5, after all the book, no matter what, I will not forsake my integrity. I want that poster in every office in Washington, D.C. <laughs> But I'd also like to have that poster in every coach's office of the NCCAA and anywhere else. Love, I'm sorry, faith. Hebrews chapter 11, you've heard me talk about I have a continuum. I literally have a literal written continuum because I don't believe the Bible's dead. I think it's alive. As old as I am, Chris Lamb, I'm not old enough to remember Moses and Rahab and all those heroes listed there. But I do remember A.D. Wood, my father. I do remember Naomi Wood, my mother. I remember my wife, my 23-year-old son, Grant. Some of you who sit in this room are in my Hebrews 11 continuum of people who are my heroes of faith. Does that make sense? Today's excellence, Philippians 4.8. I never let, um, in 16 years, I never had a team vote for a team verse. First of all, we always had one. And second, one of the few authoritarian things I would do, I said, this is going to be it. I was taught it by the guy who sat right over here last night. We called it a Christian yardstick. Whether you're a believer or not, young player, if you, need, if you have questions in life and you're not sure, see if it passes this test. Is it right? Is it true? Is it honorable? Is it noble? Is it praiseworthy? Is it excellence? Then go do that. And if not, don't go do that. Those are the traits listed in Philippians 4, 8, and 9 by Paul. We're going to talk about excellence, but from a little different place. Perspective. What's your perspective today? I can tell you mine's changed over life. As the baby of five in a country preacher's home who was an assistant principal and farmed 10 acres. My dad was very lazy. Um, he was the hardest working human being I've ever met in my life. Um, and we grew up in this incredible culture where neighbors were not five miles away, but a mile away or so, and they were glad because they didn't want the wood boys on their property. I had a very different perspective growing up than I had when I signed to go play golf at North Carolina State 
only to find out that my lack of self-discipline and Raleigh were not going to go well together. Coach made the comment that they kind of accidentally got me at Central Wesleyan College in 19... No, there wasn't an accident. There was going to be an accident if I didn't get out of Raleigh. It, it was going to be my life. I had a very different perspective. I had a different perspective as a out of college, graduated December of, of, of 1982 and walked into a full-time head men's soccer coach at Limestone College, about an hour up the road. I wouldn't have hired me, they shouldn't have hired me, but they did and I'll take the check. <laughs> had a very different perspective than the student athlete just literally days earlier. Changed real quick. Had a very different perspective as a two-eyed Natural, natural two-eyed golfer wanting to go try to play professional golf, who instantaneously became a one natural-eyed guy after a bad golf shot took one of them. Very different perspective. Very different perspective when we got married, when we had kids at 58 with a hole of cancer in my arm. My question is, what's your perspective today? Because I think perspective is critical mass. We've heard con Psalm 2. How do you wake up? What's your perspective when you wake up? I guess if you don't wake up, it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. I've never not woken up yet. But what's your perspective when you start this day? I don't joke about this. I, it, I say it. It's not trite. This is the only Friday we get this week. That's just truth. What are you going to do with it? Let's dive down into NCCA and athletic life. How do you view your institution? Your institution. Because I firm think it's firm, very, very critical that you understand and have a clear and truthful version of yours before you try to have a clear and truthful version of your opponents. And who's next door? If mine's really jaded at my place, I'm probably going to be very jaded and subjective on how I judge yours or the next. Does that make sense? Clarity. What's your perspective? Because it makes a difference. Are you accurate in that? In Mark 12, 27, it's one of three places we hear these words. First is in Deuteronomy here, and then we'll go to Luke in just a second. This was a question, this was an answer given by Jesus Christ himself when asked, what's the greatest? I would use the phrase most excellent of all these commandments. I've heard different numbers, but somewhere between 650 and 690 laws on the Jewish books those days that we had to keep. That would be brutal. I'm thankful for a Savior. But his answer was this. The most important one answer, Jesus, is this. And this gets left out, by the way. We like to start, most people, with verse 30. But before he asked him to love the Lord God with all your heart, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is, the, is one. I like to say the one. Because if we don't start there, you're probably not going to love him with all your heart if you think there's multiple choices here. If, there's, if it's random. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second one is love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And when I put them up on a white screen like this and you read it from Jesus' words, you have a perspective. Fair? These are Jesus' words and a great answer and we, we cling to this. Grandmothers have, have crocheted this and it's on walls across homes all over America. It's on iPads. People have it on posters. It's awesome. The perspective here was that Christ was giving us, hey, if you're an idiot and can only keep one thing, let's go with this. <laughs> Let me dumb it down. Let me give you the cliff notes of all the commandments. If you can't get the rest of them, if they do these two and we'll be pretty good. Perspective. Because in Luke, a very similar response is coming, but it was from a very different perspective. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus Christ. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Christ replied. How do you read it? In other words, what's your perspective? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. See, even Christ did Reader's Digest condensed versions. I love that. He set the table. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. 
What was the per perspective? Christ was brilliant. He knew the test was on. He knew the, the, the goal of the expert of the law. He gives the same words, but from a different perspective. Because following that, you know the question comes. What was it? Mr. Rogers, who, Amy, come on, who is my neighbor? The perspective? I don't want all of you to be my neighbor. Neil, I'm good with you being my neighbor. I, I like you. I can get my, I like all of you, but I can say it to my wife because she knows I'm kidding. Kelly, I don't want Kelly to be my neighbor. And she, well, that's not good because she may not want me either, but we're good right now. In other words, can I, Lord, can I select my neighbors? Even if they're at five miles away, can I pick and choose on who I'm going to love like I love myself? And Christ tells us a story. A man was going down, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do if it's okay. Anybody not familiar with the Good Samaritan? Don't be ashamed. Trust me, I, don't even, I won't embarrass you. <laughs> no, I won't. Everybody good and familiar with the Good Samaritan? Because we'll, we'll, we'll do cliff notes. So you know the story. And Christ lays out the story, and it's a dramatic story. And here comes the priest. Not being Catholic, going to a Wesleyan church. I, I picture this visually. Here comes Pastor Tom. Here comes my pastor. Down the road after the man is in the ditch and beaten and almost dead. And Tom sees the man in the ditch, almost dead. He's pious. He's religious. He's probably going to a meeting of the conference and to do something great for God. And he walks right on by. What was his perspective? I just know he left the man in the ditch. And then comes his, one, of men, one of Tom's, Billy Barlidge, let's say, a, board, a member of our board of trustees at our church. He's busy. Billy's probably volunteered the day before at the church, and now he's busy with his engineering firm, and he's headed down the road, and he's probably reciting scripture to himself and listening to Switchfoot or King and Country or Chris Tomlin. He sees the man in the ditch, and he walks on by. And then comes whoever you hate to do life with. Because I don't know who that is for you. LGBTQ person, racial issue, cultural issue, northern, southern. I don't know who you hate. But if you're the person in the ditch, the person coming by is a person you've hated all your life. And you've marginalized. We call it the Samaritan. That's who's coming by. And they stop. And they don't marginalize you. They come over and they help and you know the story. I'm not going to have you raise your hands. I just ask you, seriously, go ahead and pick. Priest, trustee, pastor, trustee, the person who you maybe have marginalized. Who are you in the story? Are you the pious, religious, arrogant, Unattentive, or are you the caregiver? Everybody got somebody? Who are you? Because the only thing we have in common is for this guy. It's the only thing we have in common. Let's do a little participation question. How many of you were ever the woman or the man in the ditch? I'll wait, because if you don't put your hand up, you're a liar. I'm going to try it again. How many of you were ever the man or woman in the ditch? And it's only from that perspective that I can get up every morning and choose excellence. Know that my God laughs at the things that we worry so much about. Knowing that God's got it, whatever it is. Because I remember where I was. I remember my perspective one time. And I remember the person who came by and did not 
do anything but reach down and care and love me out of my self-created ditch. That's what Christ followers are. We're former ditch dwellers. I didn't like the ditch as best I remember the ditch. But I have to be honest with Dan, I chose the ditch at some point in time in my life. I was willing to stay in the ditch. But Christ said, no, I've got a better perspective I'd like you to have. Don't come walk along the pastor and see that perspective. Don't come walk along the trustee, the Levite in the story. Just come see people and love them. Oh yeah. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And my neighbors as much as I love me. As you head off into summer, some of you are 10-month contract people. I mean, you, you will actually leave here today and tonight at midnight, you're unemployed. <laughs> you don't have a, you're off contract. Some of you have busy stuff. You've got to go back and relaunch and gear up. I don't know what your summer plans hold, but I would really hope you would pause before an annual meeting. And A, remember the day you were in the ditch. And remember the Savior who pulled you out of it. And to be very candid, if it's not too transparent, I think he pulls me out of the ditch every day. Because I've got the ability to slip. I've got the ability to forget. I've got the ability to marginalize. I've got the ability to blow off the needy I just walked right by. I've got the ability to consider someone more important than someone else. I've got the ability to pick my neighbors. <laughs> Join me in coming up and out of the ditch every day at your institution. Know there's one true God. Love him with everything you have in your being. And then let's love each other. Let's love our institutions and serve them well where you're called. Let's love our fellow Christian colleges. Let's love our fellow, fellow secular colleges and your peers, the people you get to do life with. Those coaches, those administrators, trainers, FARs, compliance directors, whatever they may be. You get to do life with them. When's the last time you were asked, hey, can I talk to you? by one of your maybe non-believing peers. Hey, there's something different. Can I ask you something? I live across the street from my oldest brother, my middle brother Pete and his wife Kim. And we live in the country. Two, three weeks ago, came home to find or my brother's youngest granddaughter brought a dozen eggs over to Kelly. Because Kim, Pete's wife, had borrowed three by coming over and going into the house and getting three from our refrigerator. We would never have known the difference. We don't eat a ton of eggs. Sunday night, we were doing fire pit night, which is one of my favorite things. If you're on Facebook, I will post my fire pit every time we're at it. It is one of my joys in life, along with yard working golf. I wanted a hot dog. I'm at a fire. I didn't want a s'more. I wanted a hot dog. I wanted a brat. I know, that's the gross food. I texted my brother. Kim was out with some fellow teachers eating that night. And I said, hey, you got any hot dogs? He said, yeah, there's a whole fresh pack in there. I said, Ooh, I, don't want to, I don't want to open a pack. I just want like a couple. I need some meat. I'm caveman. He goes, I, there may be three loose ones in a Ziploc bag. And I went over and I got three hot dogs from my neighbor. 
man, if we could give to each other, spiritually speaking like that, to everyone we come in contact with. Chris, what do you need? I'm only going to find that out if we do life together, if I stop and I help. I don't know. What do you need, Bob? Heather, you need prayer for you and for Jason? Got it. Patty, you need prayer? Got that now. Have a Christ-like perspective. Because I have to be honest, not being excellent 24-7, the more I find myself being excellent in Him is when I remember where I came from and where I don't want you to be. Thank you.